Good morning. If you have a Bible with you this morning, join me in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to read two verses together as we begin our time in the Word today. If you didn't happen to bring a copy of the Scripture with you, most of these references will be on the screen behind me. You can follow along that way. As you're turning, if you are here for the first time or maybe one of the first times that you've been with us, I hope you'll take a chance and fill out one of these connection cards, these orange cards. Drop it in the offering box before you leave today. We'd love to get to know you better, and this is a great way to get started. If you got a few minutes before you exit today, I'll be in the lobby right in front of the mural. I'd love to talk to you, and there are other ways that you can connect listed on this card. Another step to take would, come, would be to come on a Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Right out here in the lobby, we do something called Connection Track, which is designed for you if you are newer to our church. We'll spend about an hour with you. You'll get to meet some of the staff and learn our beliefs and our ministries and how you can get engaged. So we'd love to see you on a Wednesday night. Do this before you exit today. We'd love to get to know you better. Uh, And I know it seems like it's a long way off, uh, especially when the weather is still really pleasant, but June is coming. And uh, I say that because that is when we are doing Vacation Bible School this year. And you'll get more information, but I want to get your antennas up on that because it is one of the highlights of our calendar. Vacation Bible School Week is a tremendous and exciting week here at High Point Church, and we want your kids to be involved. So keep your eyes open as more information comes, or if you're checking your child in, the children's are out, the children's workers may be able to help you with information about that. And one other thing I've been tasked to remind you of this morning is that our Providence Academy kids kids did a walkathon about a month ago and in that walkathon they raised thirty-six thousand dollars. And uh, <clears throat> So all of that money is going to be used to furnish the new building that we're uh, putting um, right to the north of our current structure for the next school year. And that $36,000 will just about furnish that building out. So, um, so if you're still giving to the building, know that all that money will be applied towards, like we've been saying, paying for the building. So if you've been giving towards Providence Academy building or you want to start doing that, just uh, give your gift and make sure you memo it's for the Providence Academy building. And that way we're sure that all of the money will be applied that direction. Okay, we're in Hebrews chapter 13. I want to read two verses with you, starting at verse 4. As we begin this new series, first comes love, then comes baggage. Marriage should be honored by all. Marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I'm going to do something with you. I didn't do this at the 8 o'clock service, but I feel led to do it. So I want you to bow your heads with me. And if you're here this morning with the person that you're married to, or you're thinking you may want to be married to, and I'm asking for a big commitment, aren't I? Um, Reach over and grab their hand. Let's pray together. Father, um, thank you for this day for this day that comes around every seven days that reminds us you never leave us and you never forsake us. And you have everything that we have need of. It's hard for us sometimes to believe you when you promise us that when our hearts are broken and empty. And it's been a long time since we've been able to say, I love you to somebody and mean it. The world can put a patch job or offer us escape patches on our hearts but you're the only one that can fix them you're the only one that can fix them and when we get to that point where we realize it we're right on the cusp of a miracle and there are people in this place today who need a miracle And they need to learn how to love one another again. So I'm asking you, Spirit of the living God, the one who created our heart, that you will do what only you can do as we're faithful to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Johnny and Susie sitting in a tree. (laughs) K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage. Then comes a baby in a baby carriage. How many of y'all sang that song when you were growing up? Or sang it at somebody, didn't you? Because that's what you were doing. You were, that was a snarky little song that you sang to make fun of your friends because they had a girl you wanted to have. 
And, uh, and by the way, so we sing it, and, and I, 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 it's what inspired this series because we know that there's a lot of stuff that comes between love and marriage and the baby carriage. And the stuff is baggage. Baggage complicates every journey. Flying would be a blast if you didn't have to deal with the baggage. Baggage ruins it all. Jenny and I, whenever we fly, we fly El Cheapo Airlines. And um, you know which ones I'm talking about. It's the ones where you have to pay for every bag you bring on. And so we are being El Cheapo people. We'll try and pick everything into one bag. If I'm going to go and pay for a bag, I'm only getting one bag. Well, here's the problem. Jenny starts packing a week before we take off, and I pack the day of. So by the time I get there, 75% of that bag has been claimed. And you know that there's a weight limit on your bags, 39 pounds. If it gets over 39 pounds, you're paying more. So here's what we do. It's a very scientific method. Jenny makes me stand on the scales because I will never see how much she weighs. And so I get on the scale, get off. She hands me the bag. I get back on the scale. Nothing can go wrong with this plan. And if that bag weighs 39 pounds and one ounce, I hear Jack get something out of the bag. <laughs> and then after you get your bags at the right weight, you got to check your bags and you got to pay for your bags. And, and, it, and then it's even worse if you've got a carry-on bag. That's hand-to-hand -hand warfare. The stress doesn't stop all the way up to the gate. I've got this check on bag, and I'm looking around for the smallest person I can body check so I can beat them to the overhead storage compartment. And then all the way through the flight, I'm thinking, where did I leave my bag? Who am I going to, who I have to fight to get to my bag? And then when you get there, the first thing they tell you is, if you have a bag, go to this baggage claim carousel to pick it up. I have told people that the baggage carousel in the airport is the picture of your life. Everybody has baggage, and you have to claim your baggage. Now, this is pertinent because we're talking about relationships, and relationships are, are at the very heart of, the, of Christianity. In fact, one time some religious leaders came to Jesus and said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in all of the law? Wonderful question. Over 600 commandments in the Old Testament law system, so they want to know which one is the, which is the most important, and Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And it would have been wonderful if he would have just stopped there. Just love God with everything you got. Fine. We can handle that one. But Jesus has this habit of giving you more than you ask for. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And what Christ is teaching us is that everything important about our faith has to do with love. And love means people. It means people. Because in the very next verse of our text, or the fifth verse of this text, it says, keep your lives free from the love of money. In other words, don't love things, love people. And don't let things become a substitute for people, which is the greatest battle that we're fighting in our world today. These things that we carry around in our pockets are easier to love because their algorithms spit back what we want. It's difficult for us to love people. It's easier to love things because people come with baggage. From building friendships to finding a church that you want to be a part of, to contributing to a team, all the way to committing to someone for your whole life and raising a family together, you're going to deal with baggage. And this series is about that baggage, especially about the baggage we have in our marriages, in our families. We're going to talk to you about the things that you will fight about after you get married, and you will fight. It's just a matter of time. I love when these young people come to premarital counseling convinced that they will be swept through their marriage relationships on the cloud of their romance and they will never have a fight. And I give you about one week. I give you about a week. And then I will tell you the first four things you're going to fight about. We're going to talk to you about how to adjust once you have children. And I, we're going to have a, a, a sermon in this series for those of you whose hearts are being broken by a prodigal child. How do you how do you minister to and love and pray for a child that's away from the faith? And then we do have one. I don't know what I'm going to say on this one, but I've called it the secret sauce of marriage. I'm sure you're all excited to hear that one. But first, we have to deal with the biggest piece of baggage that we bring to our marriages. The, the biggest baggage that all of us bring to our marriage is simply how we think about marriage, how we view it. What do we think about it? 
And this is what Paul is getting at when he says marriage should be honored by all. Marriage should be, should be honored by everyone. If that would be the most important decision that you can make. If you want to live in a better, more godly country, honor marriage. The most important decision that you can make today will not happen in November in who you vote to be president. It will be the decision you make to love the person that you're married to. Change does not start in the White House. It starts in your house. Honor your marriage. If you want to be happy, honor marriage. If you want to have better schools, honor marriage. If you want to have a lower crime rate in your city, honor your marriage. If you want to have a stronger economy in your state, honor marriage. If you want to be happy and holy and blessed, if you want to see God's blessing come on your generation and the next generation and the next generation, honor marriage. This is one of the most, maybe the most human relational decision that you can make. Marriage is the most rewarding and challenging of all of our relationships. And I want to focus on that word, honor, because it addresses how we, how Christians especially, view marriage and how we do marriage. So let's start here. First of all, how do we view marriage? That word honor is a vintage word. You almost feel like it would be laying in a bin at a thrift store. We don't use it often. What does it mean to honor something? Well, the word means to, to value a thing, to see it as extremely precious, to assign respect and show respect to it. Now, Christians are supposed to be people who know how to honor every relationship. We, our faith is supposed to teach us how to appropriately honor everyone. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. So he mentions the emperor, that's your relationship to the government, and then he mentions God, that's the most important relationship you will ever have, and then he mentions the family of God, which means the church so there's no way that you can love God and serve him the way that you should if you don't know how to appropriately love the church. And then, and then he says, everyone, everyone. So that pretty much covers it. Because I know that some of you have someone in your mind that say, it's okay, God's okay with me not liking them. No, you have to honor everybody. You have to respect everybody. I know you all got one person on you that the Lord will understand. He's such a loser. I don't have to love him. No, you have to respect everyone every relationship. And there are different degrees of honor. He says you respect everyone, but you love the family of believers. You honor the emperor, you honor the emperor, but you fear God. So God, God is above the emperor, right? We, we show proper respect to our governing authorities, but God we fear. Everyone deserves honor. Not everyone deserves the same level of honor. And in the faith, we call this having properly ordered affections. Christians have properly ordered affections. We know how to love people. We know how to love them appropriately. That's why Jesus could say things like, if anyone follows me and does not hate his father and mother, he can't be my disciple. People who are not Christians get all put off by that, but we understand that what he's talking about is appropriately ordered affection for one another knowing what comes first and how to prioritize people. And, and so when Hebrews talks about marriage and says marriage should be honored, it uses the highest form of that word, honor. Marriage should be placed at the top shelf of human relationship, of respect and value. As we order our affections, God is the most important. He's the most highly esteemed. And because we honor our God so highly, Christians ought to highly value the marriage relationship because we honor him. Now, you guys know that the New Testament letters most of the time have two sections. There's a teaching or doctrinal section, and then there's an exhortation or an application or practical living section. And this is what, same thing here in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 13, we've entered the application stage, but Hebrews is very heavy on teaching. The first entire first 12 chapters of this letter is, is just doctrine, great truths. And, and after 12 chapters of revealing these great tr truths, he says, now, because you believe this, live this way. Because you believe this is true, this is how you ought to live your life. And the central doctrine of the book of Hebrews is 
covenant. It's, it's about covenant. It's a comparison of the old covenant that God had with Moses and the children of Israel to the new covenant between Christ and his church. He summarizes in the 12th chapter, in verse 18, he says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire. You guys know, that's the story of Moses going up on Mount Sinai and receiving the Ten Commandments, the old covenant. But he says, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people being made perfect, and here it is, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Then one chapter later, in chapter 13, he says, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you for every good work. So the new covenant is only new to us. It is an eternal covenant because it was always God's idea. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Ephesians chapter 1 says, God chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. So God had planned forever to have this relationship with his church. He had always been searching for you. He has always been planning for you. He has always been providing for this relationship that we're enjoying with him now. We're in this new covenant relationship. This is one of the, covenant is one of those forgotten words. It's synonymous with the word testament. So when you open your Bible and you're in the book of Genesis, you are reading the Old Testament. Come on, guys, don't disappoint me. I've been talking to you for a long time. It's the Old Testament. When you get to the book of Matthew, you are in the New Testament. New Testament, thank you. So, new, Old Covenant, New Covenant, every time you open your Bible, you're reading God's love letter to you. You're reading a book about how He is building a relationship to you. The whole Bible is about God planning and pursuing and paying for and establishing a relationship, a covenant with us. If the Bible is all about relationships then, what is the first human relationship that God established? It was marriage. Let me take you back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I always want to pause and give the ladies a chance to say amen on that line. It is not good for a man to be alone. The most enthusiastic amen I will get today. So I will make a helper suitable for him. And then the Lord made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman, for she was taken out of a man. And this is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. This is the first human relationship. And from this moment on, the marriage relationship serves as a symbol of our relationship to our God. In the Old Testament, you see verses like this one in Isaiah chapter 62. As a young man marries a young woman, so your builder will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. When Jesus uh, came to this earth and taught about the kingdom of God, he all of the time was using the imagery of us being invited to a wedding banquet with him. I don't think it's coincidental that the first miracle that Jesus performed before he had ever opened the first blind eye or made the first lame man walk or cured the first case of leprosy, the first miracle that Jesus performed is at a wedding reception. The wedding in Cana of Galilee where he changes water into wine. I don't think that's coincidental. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul just comes right out and says it. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. He's, he's quoting what we just read from Genesis. These two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and his church. When a man and a woman stand before God and commit to being married to one another, you're entering into a human covenant with one another that symbolizes the eternal covenant that Christ made with us. Dozens of truths that I could share with you out of that, but here's the main one for this morning. This is how Christians think about marriage. If you're a Christian, this is how you should think about marriage. Christians see marriage as a covenant. 
And a covenant is an exclusive and committed relationship based upon vows and promises that we make to one another and to God. The Hebrew word for it means oath-bound. You guys remember now the traditional vows where they still use traditional vows in the marriage ceremonies. They make you say them to one another. I take you. Uh, I take you, Bob, and I take you, Joni. And then you say, when you say I take you, what it means is I select you, I choose you, I commit to you, just like Christ left heaven to come and select us. I take you. And, And then we say, forsaking everyone else, I cleave only to you. It's an exclusive and absolute commitment. And then we swear it to one another. The Old English um, um, vows said it this way, I plight thee my troth. I love that. Just break that out on someone. (laughs) Honey, I will clean the dishes. I plight thee my troth before the day is over. Um, I plight thee my troth, but it was, it's so somber because it is somber. I swear I'm telling the truth, and it's a plight for me because I'm saying this to you, but I'm saying it in front of God. I, I'm doing it before God. God is my witness, I promise you. Christians view marriage as a covenant, a promise made to one another before God, and it's binding. Pagans view marriage as a contract. Service is offered to one another, uh, and, and, and staying it, it is conditional upon my satisfaction. We, you, we made a promise. I expected this from you. You expect this from me. We both do our part, and as long as we're both satisfied, we will keep the contract. That's the way pagans view it. So this is the first piece of baggage that you're going to have to deal with. Do you view marriage the way that God views marriage? Because many church people don't. There are people who go to church every Sunday that love Jesus, understand what the cross is all about, but they don't think about marriage the way that the Bible tells us we should think about marriage. And by the way, this is not a new thing. Sometimes we talk about sin as if, as if it began in 2015. No, folks, we've been sinning for a long time. So let me take you back to Matthew chapter 19. Some Pharisees come to him to test him. Pharisees now are the most religious people on the planet. Never miss a synagogue service. They come up messed up about marriage. They come to him and they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? They are messed up about marriage. And I know they're messed up because they start the discussion asking when it's okay for them to get divorced. So you, you probably ought to start talking to Jesus about your marriage before you're thinking about getting divorced. But this is when most people usually want to talk to God about marriage. You start praying about your marriage when you're praying, dear God, get me out of this mess. <laughs> right? Am I doing okay here? And, and, their, and their standard is, is, here's the standard. Is it okay for me to divorce my wife uh, and by the way, they were the only ones that could do it. it was, now it's much better because we can all divorce one another. It's working out much better for all of us. Is it okay for me to divorce my wife for any and every reason? Well, that is the standard of, hum- of humanity. That's our standard today. So you don't want to be married anymore. Can you tell me why? Well, he just doesn't pay attention to me. She never wants to have sex. He never helps me with the kids. She spends so much money. He's getting fat. I was so young when I got married. I I just didn't understand what I was doing. That makes me laugh. None of us understood what we were doing. (laughs) And here's my favorite. I just don't think I love him anymore. That is the most selfish thing I've ever heard. I just don't think I love him anymore. And any reason will do, because it's just a contract. It's just a piece of paper. But Jesus takes them back to the covenant. Haven't you read? Haven't you read? Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and they too become one flesh. Something happens here. This is important. You can't get divorced without ripping something. That's vital. And so here they hear the they hear the truth and like all Christian people they go, "You're right. I'll change everything." No, they come back. 
Well, well wait, why did Moses say then that we should give them a, a, a writing of divorce? This is how they respond. You see, Jesus, you see, I, I know that that's what the Bible says, but I was watching my favorite televangelist and he said this, or my church says this. I mean, yeah, we believe that marriage is really important, but, and so Moses permitted it and the church permits it. They give us an out when it comes to marriage. What about that? And Jesus says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, which by the way, is always why your marriage comes to an end. Your marriage always ends because you got a heart problem. And he says, but it was not this way from the beginning. Jesus takes them back to the covenant. And, and Jesus will always do that. If we approach marriage from the view of the culture or from what your girlfriends are telling you while you're sipping margaritas together at Chili's, it will never last. <laughs> but we have to look at it the way God tells us to look at it. We will never honor it. We will never treat it. We will just go at it like a contract. We'll see that we'll think marriage is about me being happy. Or, or about, about me um, being fulfilled or me finding my, my one. He completes me. And when you walk around with that kind of silliness in your mind, you will dishonor your marriage. You will defile your culture. Yes. And our standard has to be, what did God have in mind from the beginning? If we view marriage th that way, as a sacred covenant, as a promise that we made to God as well as the person that we married, we will value it and we will honor it and we will fight for it and we will commit to it and we will preserve it. So honoring marriage begins about with how I view it and then how I do it. Honor is about belief and behavior. Honor is something you display. It takes action. When I thought about this this last week, a memory came back from my childhood. I was living in southern Indiana um, Zenus, and, and, and if you haven't heard of it, I don't even know that the Lord's ever heard of Zenus, Indiana, um, but it was southern Indiana, and it, we called it living down south because we hadn't heard about you people south of the Mason-Dixon line at that point, and so living down south, and all of the roads were dirt until you got to Mount, uh, North Vernon, Indiana, and so we were driving uh, down a dirt road one day, and one of the county uh, deputy sheriffs had been killed in the line of action, and so his funeral procession was coming towards our car, and my dad pulled the car off the side of the road and made Jerry and I get out and stand with him with the hats off until it went by. That's honor. Honor has to be displayed when it's deserved. Honor is a soldier salute. Honor is, the Bible says, stand up in the presence of the gray-headed. That's honor. Honor is saying, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And if we say we honor something, then we display that honor. And so our text says, the text gives us um, this, and the marriage bed should be kept pure. This is because that honors marriage. You don't cheat. You don't sleep around if you want to honor marriage. And by the way, by the way, that also means you don't have an open marriage. Both of you may sit down one day, God help you, and decide that you're really progressive, and you're really tolerant, and you're really bored, and you're just good with it if y'all just want to kind of shop around uh, like this. But your marriage isn't about what you two are okay with. The Bible says God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. It isn't just about you. God is involved in your marriage relationship. God designed marriage, and when you got married, you entered in that covenant. So you may be good with it, but God ain't good with it. And then verse 5, look what he says in verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content. Now, the, the New International Version is not wrong here. It's just too narrow. The King James Version says, keep your lives free from covetousness. And covetousness and, or envy is a strong desire to have something or someone that does not belong to you. Now, look at how, go, I'm going to take you back to the Old Covenant. Look at how we're warned about it in the Old Covenant. You guys will recognize this from one of the Ten Commandments. In fact, it's the last one. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So coveting isn't just about money. It's about wanting anything that isn't mine or anyone that does not belong to me. And, and, and in this context, I think it means we dishonor and defile our marriage when we covet anyone other than the person that we're married to. So what does that say about pornography? 
What, what, what does that say about you coveting someone in your fantasies or in your imagination? It's getting quiet. <laughs> what God is saying is, keep your life free from all of these things. You honor your marriage by not defiling your mind or your body with another person. And we are called to honor other people's marriages by refusing to destroy their marriage this way. And by the way, folks, this is kindergarten level honoring of your marriage. This is just entry level honoring of your marriage. And then, let, so let me give you some other ways. These are just bullet points. We honor marriage by pursuing marriage. To that, remember that word honor means precious. Let me show you, Jesus taught a parable about the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. Just... <laughs> No, I'm not going to say it. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant just looking for a wife. And when he had found one of great value, he went away and sold everything that he had and bought it. That merchant found a precious pearl and he valued it and he pursued it. Same word, honorable. He found something of honor and he pursued that thing. Let me show you at Proverbs chapter 31. A wife of noble character who can find she is worth more than rubies. Christians ought to value marriage, so we ought to pursue marriage. Marriage ought to be a goal in your life. Do you guys realize that the marriage rate in the United States has fallen by 60% in the last decade? People aren't getting married anymore. And, and I, I came across an article this past week, and this was the opening line, marriage is dying, that's the reality. And let me give you the top six reasons why the last two generations are not getting married like they used to. Here are the top six reasons. Number one, finances. They, they have a lifestyle they want, and they can't afford it, and so they're not getting married. Keep your life free from the love of money. Isn't that what the Bible says? Okay. Career expectations. I'm trying to get somewhere. I, I paid all this money to get this degree, and now I'm trying to get a promotion, so I'm going to put off the marriage thing until I reach a certain level of success in life. That's the second reason. Here's the, I, and by the way, one of my favorite commentators says this, I don't understand why we tell women that their best and greatest superpower, which is creating another human being in their own body, is somehow less important than working as an associate law clerk. That working 2,100 billable hours and checking footnotes for some attorney is somehow more important than raising the next generation of human beings that could change the world. But I digress. Here's the third one. Gratuitous sex. Why should I get married? There's a whole lot of people I can sleep with. Number four. Lack of biological realism. I, I'm just being honest with you. How much time do you think you have? We're all getting older. I know this is depressing, but we are all getting older right here as we sit here. When you hit 30, the prospects start going down. <laughs> How much longer do you think you can wait? Here's, and here's probably, a, I would think probably a big one. You've had bad family experiences. You saw how your mom and dad behaved in marriage. You saw marriage defiled. You did, so you don't see it as a precious thing to pursue. Here's, and here's one. Unrealistic expectations. This is my favorite. You're looking for your soulmate. You're just looking for your soulmate. There's somewhere out there, there is someone who God from all eternity has picked out for me. And you know what? We used to be able to live that way when we could only deal with people in Lake Wales. I mean, the field in Lake Wales is not very big. But now we can get on and start swiping white, right? And we got, you know, we got uh, Franz in Germany. Maybe he's your soulmate. And you never know. And you just keep swiping right and swiping right and swiping right. Sometimes I, <laughs> I just want to go into a church sometime and take all the single ladies and all the single men and just line them up on opposite sides of the sanctuary and just say, pick one. Well, how do I know? How do I know if we're compatible? You're not. <laughs> You're not compatible. None of us, we're compatible. You're going to have to work it out. And I'm telling you, Pablo down in Puerto Rico, who you just knows the guy, when he shows up, you're going to find out, oh my gosh, 
I should have married Bubba. <laughs> so I'm, oh my gosh, I got to move. Okay, come, so let me come back and wrap this up. Let's go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. I'll make a helper. God calls the woman a helper. And Adam's problem wasn't just that he was alone. It's that God had given him something to do with his life. Remember, he said, God said, I will make man in my own image. And so in the image of God, he made them male and female. And he told them, multiply and fill the earth and bring it under submission. We've been given a mandate to order creation in the way that God pleases him. And we do that by having and raising godly children. And by the way, that still requires a man and a woman. So, so remind your friends who denigrate the faith by saying they follow the science. Men can't get pregnant. And we honor marriage by recognizing that it is between one man and one woman, and they both have to be there. So yes, marriage provides companionship and all of this, but marriage is also about two people who need each other to do what God has called us to do. So Christians ought to value and pursue marriage. It, marriage ought not to take a back seat to other priorities. You ought not, should not dishonor marriage by making it less important or rank choicing it behind finding, finding yourself or climbing the corporate ladder or becoming a girl boss. We honor marriage also by honoring the person we're married to. Okay, here's what Paul says, and this is long. Submit, submit to one another. This is for the church. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands like you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Husbands, love your wives just like Christ loved the church. I just want to stop and let you gentlemen think about that. Love your wives. They're taking a big risk marrying you. <laughs> Love your wives like Christ loved the church. Like Christ loved the church. Honey, could you take out the garbage? Man, you guys, you just jam it in there, jam it in there. We got five other people living in this house. Why didn't somebody else take the garbage out? Like Christ loved the church. <laughs> Honey, I need gas in the car. Could you put gas in my... You drove past 10 gas stations! to get home today like Christ loved the church like Christ loved the church am I doing all right yes. honor and and by the way listen I, I, my wife's here so I got to be honest I, I stink at this I mean I, I do this and then God has to pop me in the head and say like I loved my church Jack like I loved my church that's how you're supposed to love your wife. I, I think Jesus would have probably stopped at a gas station for her. Your faith determines how you do marriage, by the way. So let me finish that. He loved the church and gave himself up for her so he could make her holy, so that he could cleanse her, and, and so that he could present her to himself. You get the, you get the wife that you create. I mean, so he could present himself, her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, holy and blameless. And this is the same way a man should love his wife, like, they're, like she's his own body for members of one another. And for this reason, here we are back at this covenant thing again, a man should, will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one. Now, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Now, that, word, that all comes in the context of the church. If you ever want to read it, go back and look at that chapter. In the few verses before that, he says, you guys get together as a church, and you sing with one another, and you worship together so that you can be filled with the Spirit. You do that, you do that all of the time. You get together, and you worship together so you can be filled with the Spirit so that you can go home and submit to one another. And so I'm just going to tell you this. You need the church for your marriage. You, you need what you get here so you can take it home and love one another the way you're supposed to. 
And by the way, just let me say this. Your faith should transform your marriage. Your desire to honor Christ should translate into desire to honor your spouse. If you understand and appreciate what Christ has done for you, it will change how you treat the person you're married to. Now, two things. Again, real quickly, many marriages fail because you treat the people at church better than you treat the people at home. And we're loving and patient and forgiving with one another at church, but we're prideful and selfish and impatient and unforgiving when we're home. If you treat your, your pastor better than you treat your husband, you got a problem. And if, you, if, you, if you're more respectful and considerate to the ladies at church than you are to the lady in your home, you're a hypocrite. And here's another thing, we're called to honor our spouse. And we do that in different ways as husbands and wife. But Paul, um, Paul says that the wife honors the husband by being in submission, but the husband honors the wife in sacrificing for her. And again, he does this so that he might make her more radiant. Is your wife a radiant person? Because that's your responsibility. Okay, to some degree, you create the person you're married to. Do we honor them? Are we serving? Are you trying to make your husband a more confident leader? Is your husband a confident leader? That's your responsibility. Now, I want you to think about this all the way down to the details. How do you talk about your spouse when you're talking to other people about them? How do you, um, how do you talk to them? Gentlemen, are you still a gentleman with your wife? Do you open the door for her? Do you compliment her? Her strengths now, not the stuff that you hound dogs compliment. Do you compliment her strengths? We honor marriage by how we view it and by how we do it. So this is how we experience the blessing. Paul says, these two people become one. And this is a great mystery. It is. It's a great mystery. I don't know how it happens. Marriage isn't a technique. Marriage is a holy process. You become one. Here's how it happens. This is all I can tell you. I know you guys were looking for eight steps to make it sizzle. I don't know. I don't have them. But here's how it happens, I think, in real life. A man and a woman fall in love. And they stand in front of God and they make promises to one another. And then they keep their promise. You keep your promise. You mess up. And you do stupid things. And you break each other's heart. And then you say you're sorry. And you get up off the floor. And you start doing it over again. And you do this day after day. And year after year. Through diapers and bills and morning breath. And you become one. And it takes commitment. That word united means you get stuck together like glue. glue. Listen, living together in order to see if you're compatible. I've already told you, you're not compatible. Marriage doesn't work because two people are compatible. It works because two people are committed. All people who are living together is doing is play acting with sex on the side. So pay close attention to the order. You leave, you cleave, and then you become one. And, and, and you've got to make the commitment before you ever get to the mystery. But then the mystery happens. Jenny and I are going to celebrate 37 years together this year. And <laughs> that's all for you, Jay. She'll take a bow later. 30, 37 years together, and 33 of them have been wonderful. <laughs> that's truer than you all understand. And I, I just realized, we've talked about this together, that I'm married to my best friend. Now, when did that happen? How? I don't know. I don't know. I can only, I can only tell you that we fought a lot and we forgave. I could take you back to year number 13 when we were sitting in a counselor's office and couldn't even look at each other and couldn't stand one another. And I, did, I remember calling my dad thinking I was coming home because it was all over 24 years ago. But somehow, somehow you found the grace to just try one more time. And we made the mistakes and we moved on and we just kept on coming back. 
And somehow you learn how to love one another. You learn how to love one another. You learn how to love one another. And that's what the Bible calls holiness. And it's a big goal of marriage. It's a holy partnership. And it begins when we make up our mind that we're going to honor it the way God tells us to. Why don't you all pray with me? Father, we thank you. I'm, I'm, I want to I wanna ask you, Holy Spirit, because I believe that there are couples here who really do want to learn, but they're in a hard and difficult place right now. It would be a miracle if they could just look at one another and say, I love you again. And we're taught, Lord, to hide this stuff to try and make everyone think that we've got it going on and it's perfect that we're doing well when we're not. And so I'm praying, Lord, that you would help us to uh, push past all of the lies and the pride that would keep us from getting the help that we need. Beginning right now, Lord, I'm praying for the, the people that are in this room who were thinking that this week would be the week they'd say goodbye that they'd finally make the phone call, they'd finally dial up the lawyer, that maybe first they would get on their knees before you, the one who pulled them together, the one they say that they're committed to, and I'm asking you, God, to help them believe just one more time that if they honor their promises, you will honor yours. God, I'm praying that people will walk out of here with a renewed commitment. They may not have a renewed passion, they may not have any renewed emotion, but a renewed commitment to one another to do whatever it takes to do whatever it takes to honor one another and to honor you because everything hangs on us keeping our promises. Lord, help us to do real business with you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. One more song, folks. As we, as we close this service, if you need prayer, you come. There are people that will meet you here. If you're here as a couple and you need someone to pray with you, come while we sing this last song. Both sides of the stage.